YouTube, hello, mm -hmm. Facebook. And we will be letting people right. in the waiting room in about 40 seconds. And um, what we do is I'll play a theme song, which I actually can't find because I'm on my own. I can't find what our, so I've just, I'm using another theme song. And why don't um, you sing, Todd? I could sing. But there's <laughs> only one song I know. <laughs> and that, that song is, I bet it's a song because none of you are from the United States. It's a song that none of you would know. It was a popular song in the US in the 1920s. And it was called Hallelujah, I'm a Bum. <laughs> oh, sing it. Why don't I work like other men do? Well, how can I work when the skies are so blue? Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give me a handout. Revive me again. That's it. That's all I know. Excellent. You got it. All right, let's let everybody in. <laughs> Here we go. All right, I'm going to share my music and computer audio. Share. Here we go. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first VBC coffee hour in about six months. I think we we stopped doing these uh, last last July uh, when we started doing in person events again, and we just thought that since um, you know we're not doing in person events in the first couple months of of 2022, we would revive our coffee hour once again. And uh, so it's good to see. And I know it, it's, what's cool about the coffee hour is we get people who join us in the morning here um, who normally don't join us in the evening. And so it's good to see some familiar faces. I see Jeff Witherell. Happy New Year, Jeff. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, Bill Moran. Hi, Bill. Good to see you. Sean Hall. How are you? Good to see you, Sean. Um, uh, I could give hosting duties to you, maybe, or maybe co-host. Are you co-host, Sean? I am not. At this point, you could make me. Okay, I'll make you co-host. Let me do that here, if you don't, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Ron Gianta, good to see you, Ron. Ron always joins us. He's a welcome face here in our VBC Coffee Hour because uh, Ron helps gives us updates on the VA he is a, the go-to person I know who connects to the VBA, Veterans Benefits Administration. Thank you, Ron, for coming. Don Nemchek, of course. Carol Popchak, I see she's hidden. Um, but uh, man, it's it's great to see you all. Um, and who do we have? I see Mary. Mary, um, I don't, you mind introducing yourself? I just wanna, I'm looking around for people who might be here for the first time. Alan Vogel, I know is in, he's gonna talk in a little bit. Um, hi, Mary. My hi. name is Gunter Nitsch. I was born in Germany, have been in the United States since 1964. We live in Chicago. And I'm Mary Nitsch. Very loving. Gunter, good to meet you, Gunter and Mary. How did you hear about us? Well, Mr. Scott. Scott Masters. Scott Masters, thank uh, you. Oh, Scott, he's Scott the greatest. Is, Scott, is, Scott is reading uh, Gunter's book right now. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us, Gunter. Scott might have emailed me about this, but I'm about 24 hours behind on my emails. So as I usually mm -hmm. am. So um, uh, maybe I haven't, maybe he told me that you'd be here, but welcome. Thank you for coming. And are you here to help share some of your memories of growing up in, in Europe in World War II? I was born in 1937. And I wrote a book about my childhood called Weeds Like Us. In 1945, we got caught by the Russians, and the book deals from 45 to 1950. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Well, we want to hear your story, and we also want to hear Dagmar's story. Hi, Daggy, who's joining us from Springfield, Missouri. Uh, Daggy was born in 1934. Uh, George Z Z uh, Zweigstra is joining us from Halifax, Nova Scotia. George was born, I believe, in 1935. 33. 33. Oh. In... <laughs> you look like you look like you were born in 1935. Um, 1930... 
1933 in northern in the Netherlands, in the northern part of the Netherlands. And what Gunter, Dagmar, and George all have in common is because they were born where they were, when they were, they were fated to experience the trauma of World War II in Europe firsthand. And, you know, we read about World War II and it's always, you know, it's taught in, in, in school and it's taught in college. And uh, sometimes we uh, Americans, you know, think about World War II as the big global struggle it was, and it was you know, a world changing event. Um, but for those who were children in the battle zones in World War II, it was a trauma that shaped the rest of their lives if they were lucky to have a rest of their lives. And I was just reminded of that reading. I got Dag Daggy's book. Dagmar wrote a two-part book, memoir of her of her time in Europe, uh, growing up. And um, I don't know how you made it, Daggy. I really, I really don't. The traumas that you experienced, it just it's so inspiring. And I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this program is just a, a reminder uh, of of you know a war that was raging 80 years ago today. Um, it is still very much affecting our world and the lives of the people who survived it. Uh, and in, in addition to George and Daggy and, and, and Gunter, uh, we have Tracy Bota or Botha, who is joining mm -hmm. us from South Africa. And we have Alan Vogel also, who's joining us from South Africa because they are involved in a really great project called Save the Skymaster. Some of you might be old enough to remember the C-54 Skymaster which was a great cargo airplane developed at the very end of World War II and carried into service well into, I believe, the 1970s. Alan, you are really the expert on the Skymaster. If Daggy and Gunter and George don't mind, let's start with um, Tracy and Alan, uh, who have joined us to share about their, their nonprofit called Save the Skymaster. First of all, I wanna ask you, let me ask Alan first, for, for say, hello to Alan. I haven't met him yet. We've corresponded, but I haven't said hi. Alan, you are in, are you in South Africa now? Hi, hi. Uh, thank you, Todd, for uh, inviting us to this meeting and uh, to share our project, our fantastic uh, C-54, which is we rescuing from the grave, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, Tracy's working with me uh, alongside this pro project. And um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Just let me oh, know. Oh, we, uh, we can hear you very clearly. But okay, I'm curious. First of all, what time is it in South Africa? It's five past four in the afternoon. Okay, five past four in the afternoon. And um, you are, you, from your accents, it sounds like you were both born and raised in South Africa. Well, I was actually born in Zimbabwe. Okay. Zimbabwe in, in Africa. And mm. what connected you to this project to uh, restore and save a C-54 in, you know, northeast of, of London in England? Well, I think Alan can answer that. <laughs> I think I'll let you in on the story about Save the Sky Master. Yeah, um, why don't you? Um, the aircraft arrived in England in 2002. And uh, it was one of two Sky Masters that were, flew over together from the USA to feature in the mm -hmm. film about the Berlin airlift uh, and with the, the candy bomber. It was yeah. going to be called the candy bomber. Um, HBO were tasked with uh, securing three aircraft uh, and two of them made it to the UK. Um, they were purchased by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks um, from an outfit uh, in the, I would say the northeast of the of, of the USA, called um, uh, it was Jim Vozell and um, it they operated this C fifty four for approximately eight years under Atlantic Warbirds. That was the company that on the organization they we were operating it uh, under. They had several other Warbirds as well, uh, C forty sevens. Uh, B-25 Mitchells, and they would tour America for about eight years uh, displaying these aircraft. Um, prior to that, they, they had gone to the uh, Arizona Boneyards and inspected several Skymasters, which had been abandoned out there. And this one had been a prime candidate in 1995 to save uh, for their mission, uh, um, which is a very similar mission to what we're doing today. 
today. You know, you have a video on your website that's about a minute and a half. Do you mind if I share it with everybody so that they can get a sense of what this project entails? So, sorry, could you just repeat the question? Uh, do you, do you, you mind if I, if I share the video that's on your website? Please about, do. And then, okay. uh, yeah, by, ahead. By, by all means, go ahead. And Here we go. And that comes from the website savetheskymaster.org. And uh, if you go to savetheskymaster.org, you could learn a lot about the project. Uh, and I'm interested in the project because I'm a historian and I know that the Sky Master was created uh, at, at the very end of World War II, 1945. I think it was involved in mainly in Pacific War action as a replacement, a cargo plane to replace the C-47. Is that correct, Alan? I would say that uh, Sky Masters have been around since, since the, the late 30s. Um, they were developed firstly as a passenger airline and then into military transports. As, oh. So the, they were a, an, initially a, a DC-4 um, oh. and then, then they were re-equipped uh, and militarized for, as the C-50, C-54s. Um, they didn't replace uh, C-47s. Um, they worked in parallel with them. Um, it was an aircraft that could fly the longest and the furthest at the time uh, of any other aircraft during World War II that was produced. Uh, hence, uh, you know, President Roosevelt, uh, Winston Churchill uh, ha had a Sky Master and they would get around to various meetings around the globe that they needed to do during World War II in Sky Masters. Um, so the first, the first uh, Air Force One essentially was a C-54 Sky Master. It was, yeah, yeah 100%. Right. Um, and that aircraft still survives today. It's got, got a built-in lift. As you know, uh, um, President Roosevelt was uh, disabled, and so he couldn't go upstairs or anything, so he had a lift built into his. And I think that aircraft is now in the Smithsonian. And they were in the C-54s in the U.S. were in use until the 70s, I know Ben Wright would know this. Ben is a, a C-130, former C-130 pilot with the Air Force. Uh, ben, I'm sure you remember C-54s. Do you, do you know, do you, can, do you remember much about them? Well, they were, were still flying when uh, I went on active duty in the late 60s. <clears throat> I went on board one that was still uh, flying at Kelly Air Force Base, uh, Texas, uh, just to look at it. But um, as Alan pointed out, you can get on the Air Force One one that has uh, FDR's uh, elevator on it at the uh, Air Force Museum at Dayton, Ohio. And so that one's there and you can go on board and check it out. Yes. So this was a, a long lived uh, aircraft for the for the U.S. And it, I think what maybe Americans don't understand as well as Europeans might is it has symbolic importance around the world, not only because it fought in World War II, Korea and Vietnam, but also because of its role in humanitarian missions around the world? Alan, if you wanna answer that. 
We may have lost Alan. Alan? Tracy, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. still here. I, okay. oh, I'm back. Go. I have got very, very temperamental signals, so I apologize. Yeah, I, I just wanted you to speak a little bit about the humanitarian role, that, or the role that the C-54 has played in humanitarian missions around the world in history. Uh, well, certainly the C-54 was the stalwart of all humanitarian efforts between the, the, the 40s and the 50s. Well, um, even in um, Operation uh, Magic Carpet, I don't know if you're familiar with that, of the, mm -hmm. the Ammonite Jews that were rescued very swiftly by the Americans. And uh, I think, speaking correctly, some 48,000 were rescued in a, in, a, in a matter of days out of Yemen and taken back to Israel. Uh, and that's not a story a lot of people know about. And uh, other than that, the humanitarian, the biggest one of all is the Berlin airlift, as you're familiar with. And um, that's the one that we are really paying tribute to with this aircraft. However, she didn't uh, you know, partake in the Berlin airlift herself. Uh, she was part of the squadron that was an airlift squadron. Um, but she was based in the Pacific and uh, spent all her flying and military life in the Pacific. Um, one particular flight that she made was uh, coming back from Iw Iwakuni in Japan to Chicago. Um, sorry, from Iwakuni to, to uh, Iwakuni, Japan, to San Francisco, San Francisco to Delaware. And that was when she brought uh, British POWs back from the Burma campaign. Oh that my! The Japanese had taken prisoner. Oh my! That the very plane that you're restoring was involved in that. She was. Yeah, that was the longest uh, humanitarian uh, um, yeah, journey that she put, she took, flying from Japan to to Delaware. You mentioned the Berlin airlift. Daggy was there in Berlin during the Berlin airlift in 1948, 1949. This was an extraordinary 11 month effort to supply West Berlin, the city of West Berlin with everything they needed, all the coal and fuel and food and medicine that a city would need to survive uh, being cordoned off from the rest of the world. And Daggy was there for it. And I, I don't know if you remember the C-54s, Daggy. Um, Yes, I do. <laughs> you do, huh? Of course I do. And I've got the little replica here that was Colonel Halverson's plane. You see that? Oh, yes. Lovely. Yeah, that Lovely. was given to me as a gift, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, when I was talking at, at Pittsburgh Library. Uh, yeah, I do remember, and I'm so grateful for all these memories that for me actually are good ones after the war. I mean, that C-47, those C-47s were a lifeline for you and your family and your community yes. and your neighborhood. Yes. yes, and they were pretty noisy, I tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My mom and I lived on the fourth floor uh, under the rooftop. And the first day that they flew over our rooftop, every five minutes of plane, my mom were laying on the floor in our kitchen because the first thought we had was bombing. Bombing was going on because the noise was so, so loud, so reminded us. And mom and I must have been laying on the floor for five minutes. But then she got up and she said, Daggy, get off the floor. They're not dropping bombs. They're helping us to stay alive. That's and right. Yeah. It became music to our ears in that year that wow. they were flying, it became music, you know, to our ears. <laughs> Amazing. Lovely story. Uh, <laughs> and oh, I'm so grateful. I am so grateful to be able to, to tell it, still to be here to tell the stories. So you, very you know, the, the reason why the planes were so loud and why they were shaking your apartment building was because they were flying so low. They didn't yeah. have far to fly. They were just, you know, they were flying really a, a yeah. few dozen miles from uh, West Germany into West Berlin. Yeah. And, you know, it was a very short flight. They would just stop long enough to unload the cargo, go yeah. back and do it again. Yeah. So it was a constant nonstop 24 hour a day. Well, thing. Todd, uh, I stood out on a, 
we had a little platform in front of our kitchen window. We were right under the roof. And I stood out on that platform. And when the plane came over, I could see the pilot. Man. I would wave. I would stand there waving, <laughs> waving <laughs> at the pilots because they were life giving. They were heroes. They were heroes, life giving yeah. people, you know. And I was just waving at them. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, uh, yeah. Bob, I don't know if uh, people realized. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, I don't know if people realize that they did lose quite a few C-54s <laughs> that strayed off course and the Russian uh, MiGs and Yak fighters shot them down. So a few did go, go missing, sadly. And because their mission was to keep a city alive, they had to fly in all kinds of weather, all kinds of conditions. Uh, they were really absolutely pushed the limits to yeah. what air traffic control can do yeah. to get planes up and in and land and then out again. I mean, one right after the other, and uh, and it never stopped, and so yeah, it was really hazardous, very exhausting duty, and a lot of the pilots were World War II veterans like Gail Havers Halverson, who re were recalled unhappily so for this mission in in Germany, and after World War II, and what's remarkable is Gail who you know, could have grumbled like so many pilots did and, you know, had a right to do. Um, Gail instead decided after meeting some children in, in West Berlin to drop candy packages from little parachutes. And Dagmar was one of those who got one of those candy packages. And <laughs> by accident, by accident, because I did not stand at the airport like most of the children did. I was 14 years old by that time and was already going to work out of school and going to work to earn a living to help my mom. But I was on a walk from my house to an errand for my mom. And I walked by another house that an airplane had crashed into and the crew had died. I stopped at that house and like I would always do, I, you know, I learned to pray during the war. And I stood there and I said my prayer for knowing that these people were helping us and they were gone. Yeah. And I walked a little bit further down the road after that. And there on the sidewalk, I saw something laying in front of me. So when I got close to it, it was a very dirty parachute. But on the end of it was still something good. And I knew exactly who was the one that dropped it. So I bent down and picked it up and I did what little was left and I ate it. And I knew it was Gail <laughs> Halverson that had dropped this and it was meant for me because I was quite a ways from airport Timberhof on my walk. So the wind must have carried it over to the sidewalk that I was walking on. And I found this goodie. And with mm. that, finding that and knowing about him, my love and my story for this man began when I was 14 years old. And it carries on to the point of 87 going on 88. I just love him. <laughs> and my husband is not jealous that I have another <laughs> love in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and people need to know that, um... You know, it wasn't just candy for you. If people understood how you were hungry during the war, oh, yeah. and I mean for years during the war, you and your family getting enough to eat to survive was a real struggle. Oh, yeah. And um, so this must have been like a just a gift from heaven. It, it, it was. And we I connected Colonel Halverson being Easter Bunny and Santa Claus <laughs> <laughs> in the uniform. And, and the he, pilots that flew over my hometown, West Berlin, I had a special name for them. I call, called them angels that had metal wings. All uh, of them were angels that have metal wings. And they are definitely heroes to 2.2 million people at that time. And you know, I and mean, Gail, Gail is still amazing. going strong at age 101. He was on our program in 2020. Would love to have him on again. I know he's still he's still out and about, and and he's endorsed the project Save the Sky Master. Mm -hmm. And it's not just um, Tracy 
both uh, it's not just um, restoring the airplane that is important to you. It's the programming that you have around it, right? It's, it's an educational center. It's also a center of veterans, uh, you know, kind of, kind of a, a, a project uh, that veterans can get involved in. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, um, we have various projects that basically what, what um, the Skymaster represents is an icon of hope. If you look at, at her history, in the past, she was known as the Mercy Ship of the Skies because she would bring uh, blood that was needed for the front line and penicillin to the front line and then take back the wounded for treatment. And what we're doing is we're perpetuating this icon of hope into make it relevant today by holding uh, courses for veterans who've just come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with um, life skills, emotional skills, getting them out of their, you know, their loneliness and and back into working with the team. And you know, the the Skymaster team is a very unique. It's like a little family. Um, when these veterans join us in whatever capacity, they, they form part of an incredible network, um, which is very powerful. And so in this way, we bring hope back. Even So even now, we're fulfilling that same mandate that we did decades ago. And we're also educating, we're helping engineering students at a local college um, come to terms with the uh, practical side of engineering. Um, and then when COVID lifts more, we'll look at schools and scouts coming and basically transforming the inside of the Skymaster into a flying museum or flying classroom, so to speak. So we're really maximizing its use, uh, Todd, um, as much as we can. And my understanding is it's right here that the airplane itself is right here located at a small airfield called North Weald Airfield, maybe. That's um, right. Northeast of London. And it sits here and this is where the project is. And this is where uh, people go to work on the plane and to uh, get the education. How could people, I mean, you know, most of our people who are involved in the Veterans Breakfast Club are here in the U.S. Uh, if people wanted to help or support what you and Alan are doing, what's the best way for them to help? I, I think the best way, Todd, is to go to our website. There are various ways one can get involved. Um, you know, obviously, we have a donate section, or one could become a member. Or if you just want to receive our, our newsletter, which doesn't cost anything and goes into quite a lot of detail about the history of Skymaster, just sign up for our newsletter. And, and that's great. Um, in terms of the veterans, the training, if you know of any veterans in the UK who are in, in need of us reaching out to them, if you could just put them in touch with us and we'll be running courses in March with them, with funds. We've actually been given awarded funds from the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, as well as the Veterans Foundation, which we will put to good use in March. So, so it's as simple as that, really. Um, but can I can I also add something there, Tracy, uh, uh, for Todd? Sure. Is that um, we have quite a good support from the American companies in uh, yes. for the Skymaster. Um, there's a company in uh, Atlanta that assist us with spark plugs for for the aircraft uh, and ignition systems for the aircraft, and they gladly. Uh, supply us with that as a uh, as basically a gift and that keeps the aircraft uh, running and will do through her lifetime um, we also have a fabrics company in california that's supporting us uh, as well as uh, some some uh, veterans uh, u.s marine corps veterans that have signed up and joined us from florida uh, california uh, and um, it's other other parts i think one up in Massachusetts as well. So they're, they're out there and we welcome the support from uh, the American side of the, of, of the globe. And um, it, it could be anything. It, it could be just, just, you know, a warm support, a gesture, 
whether it's a donation or putting in us, us in touch with uh, somebody that might be able to assist us acquiring a part or some spares or something along those lines. Yeah. So yeah, I get, yeah. I mean, when I, I just you know know I know secondhand when you have, when you have something as old as a C fifty four to maintain. A lot of what you need isn't necessarily being produced nowadays. You've got to really, it has to be custom made or you have to find it on a secondhand market somehow. Um, so yeah, I could just imagine that main, maintaining the machine is, is a full-time job. Um, I want to thank Sean Hall for putting the link to save the skymaster.org in our chat here on the Zoom side. Uh, Sean, you. if you could also put it in, on, on Facebook and YouTube, that would be wonderful. And we will help get the word out. And I hope that you'll... Um, Stay in touch with us, Alan and Tracy. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Tim. As you know, things develop and you have new projects, new developments you want to you want to share with us. Can I tell them how we got in touch with each other? Please do. Okay. There is an organization out there. I wouldn't call it a rival. They have their own market. We have their own market. They are called the Veterans Breakfast Club. And they're in Britain, the UK. It's the UK Veterans Breakfast Club. And every once in a while, people send me notes uh, asking me questions about, you know, when is the next meeting in, in you know, Liverpool? And how I have to tell them, you know, hey, you got the wrong Veterans Breakfast Club. <laughs> and that's what I think, Tracy, I think you emailed. It was you me. Said, I was the culprit. Yeah, you said it. And it was great because I <laughs> what I always say is, you know what? It's the wrong email, but why don't you join us? We're better than that other group. <laughs> so I hope that you, I hope that you Thank did. You. And I, I actually am working on, I'd love to have a, do a program with the, some UK veterans breakfast clubs. Uh, Cause I think that would be That's a fun awesome. thing to do. Yeah. Um, oh, well, we, we're just so grateful for your support and, and giving us this opportunity, Todd, because, you know, we, um, as I was saying earlier, and some people might've missed it. We've been working with Gail Halverson directly and um, he's he just recently endorsed our project, right? In, in a very very nice way. And anyone who wants a copy of that, if they just let me know, or uh, you can give them my details. Um, no problem. Wonderful, Tracy. Tracy Allen, thank you so much. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for joining us all the way from South Africa. Take care. Yep. Stay healthy. Stay well. And uh, we'll you. be in touch. We That's will do. Super. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let thank me turn. You. Let me turn to George because we haven't heard from George yet. Uh, George Zwagstra. Um, I'm not asleep yet. So. You're not asleep yet. Good, 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 good. That's key. Um, <laughs> George, uh, George and I got connected through Scott Masters, of course, in Toronto at Crestwood Preparatory College. And uh, I want to thank George and Daggy and Gunter because they have preserved their story and their family story. Gunter and Daggy grew up in Germany, but you grew up in the Netherlands, the northern part of the Netherlands, George? Uh, the northern part in the province of Friesland. And what do they, what language do they speak there? Uh, at that time, uh, it was mostly uh, Dutch, but a lot of people were talking Frisian language as well. And the Frisian language was actually the original language. However, over the years, things have changed and a lot of it is Dutch now, but now it's changing again. They want to get the Frisian back. And of course, uh, almost everybody talks English. Right. And you were one of three boys growing up, right? Yes, I was. The one Which on one? the uh, facing, the one on the left, there's, uh, that's myself, uh, my younger brother and my older brother. And your older brother, Pierre, just passed away last month. I'm very sorry about that, George. Thank you. And yeah, he, uh, he served in Vietnam. Yes, he did. And he served in World War II as, um, as part of the resistance. Can you yeah. tell me? Yeah, go ahead. So you were not born in 1933. That means when uh, Germany invaded the Netherlands, you were about seven years old? That's right, yeah. What do you remember of the invasion? Uh, it was on a Saturday night. Uh, and uh, of course, it had been expected for quite a while, quite a while already, but uh, nothing seemed to happen. And now all of a sudden on the 10th of, <coughs> 10th of May, on Saturday night, uh, they just took over the country. They came every which way possible, uh, including falling from the sky. So actually, we didn't know until the Sunday morning uh, that uh, 
the fighting was going on. Uh, there were heavy fighting, and the Dutch put on a severe fight, and there were many casualties on both sides. However, uh, four days later, uh, Rotterdam was bombed, and it took about uh, 60 German aircraft to bomb the city, and the whole center was just went. It was completely gone. I believe 3,000 were killed, and roughly 30,000 houses, buildings, stores uh, just disappeared. Uh, the Dutch government was given uh, the notice that either stop your fighting or more set cities will go. So uh, the Queen Wilhelmina and the government fled to England and the Netherlands capitulated. This is one of the iconic photos from World War II, the bombing of Rotterdam on May 14th, 1940, one of the most, I guess, notorious uh, carpet bombing of a city uh, of World War II. Here it is. This is there are several photos that are kind of that we all have in our collective memory here. This is one of them. Um, just a devastating bombing, the bombing of Rot Rotterdam. How did your family react to this? Yes, new um, world. <laughs> I, it's kind of hard because almost you, you didn't hear, yeah, people were, I, can't, I don't really know, uh, people were afraid what is going to happen. I think this was the most important thing of all. And uh, it wasn't long after the war had started that if, as kids, we had any questions at all, uh, our parents would say, look, don't ask anything about the war. Don't talk to anybody you don't know. And the less you know, the better it is for all of us. And this is how it went all through the war. And uh, even as of today, I have never, never heard anything about the war at all uh, from my parents, how everything went. Everything that I have found out has been um, through interviews I've done, uh, through people I've met at Pier 21. Uh, and I met a lot of people there that survived the Holocaust or families of the people that survived the Holocaust. I met many, many war brides, uh, mainly from the Netherlands and Great Britain. And I met a lot of war veterans uh, from Canada and the US and some European countries. Uh, there again, too, uh, most of the veterans don't want to talk about the war at all. And I think this is such a shame because once they're gone, the stories are gone. Right. We have to get the stories out. Pier 21 is a museum of stories, and I've been very fortunate there because quite often when there were war veterans there that I talked to, uh, if they came with family, uh, the family would leave and leave me with a war veteran, and they opened up uh, to me. Uh, and that was the same with my parents. Why? Yes. They didn't want to hurt their families. And I think there's the same it was with my parents. Um, it was 1943, in August 1943, the older uh, people in the Netherlands had been shipped to Germany to work in the factories because the German uh, men were in the army. In 43, the younger from, I believe, 16 on, uh, had to report for duty. And of course, many of them did go. However, a lot of them did not go and they joined the resistance. The resistance until that time uh, was not really completely organized, but from 43 on, it was well organized. And my parents had a grocery store and they had somebody working for him, for them to deliver groceries. And of course he didn't show up one morning. 
I couldn't ask why not. Uh, <laughs> I had an idea, but I couldn't ask why not. Anyway, uh, Dad came to me and he said, you know, from now on, I think uh, he is not coming back. So you have to deliver some groceries for us. That was set up in such a way, I didn't know why, but that was set up in such a way that uh, most of the contacts I had had children my age. And the reason for that was, I found out afterwards, uh, if I would go to some place, for instance, where there was just a couple living and I would go in and out, it would be suspicious. If there were children there, um, Sometimes dad would say, you don't have to come back right away. You can play for a while or whatever it was. So there were different ways of setting things up. Groceries, I would go there with a bicycle with a big basket in front and with several groceries in it, in bags. And sometimes uh, when I gave it to the people there, sometimes she would come and say, well, look, uh, George, uh, I didn't order this, will you give that back to your father? That was the answer to the question. Or I would, uh, or, she would or she would come to me and say, look, you know, tell your dad that I didn't get, and she would mention something. Uh, that would be the answer to a question. So there were several different ways, but also uh, I had a, uh, elderly couple and their daughter worked for mom and dad in the in the grocery store and this is something that I really thought I started to thinking but because why didn't she take groceries home when she left the after her tour of duty uh, at night time uh, I would have to go to a small farmer and uh, go there and uh, pick up a bottle of milk for them. Now, sometimes she would say to me, I uh, only have half a bottle of milk. So I would take it over to the lady and, uh, and she knew what that meant. Or uh, I only have a little bit of milk or I have a full bottle for you. So those are actually the answers. And I couldn't ask questions. I, but being as young as I was, 10 years old, uh, I got kind of an idea. So let me, let me uh, I guess, paraphrase what you've just told us, just so that everybody is clear. Uh, your family owned a grocery store in the Northern Netherlands, and your father, your family was involved in the resistance, but they couldn't tell you anything. I mean, the less you knew, the better. In case you were asked questions, you could honestly say, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I see Daggy just nodding her head here because I read in her memoir, she was told over and over and over again by her family, you don't know anything. Just if you're asked anything, you don't know anything. And they either deliberately kept in the dark. So in 1943, a, a, a delivery man, boy, for the, your family's grocery store disappeared, never came back. Who knows what happened to him? You don't oh, know. He, but He did come back. Oh, he did he, come back. Yeah, he went to the resistance. Oh, he wonderful. Didn't, he didn't go to Germany. He went with the resistance. He went to the resistance. Yeah. Um, but you had to take his job as a 10-year-old boy and begin delivering groceries. And as you're delivering groceries, you're, of course, set, delivering messages also. Yeah. And to, to the people you're delivering groceries to and also back to your father. So your father is acting as a sort of a, a conduit for messengers within yeah. the resistance. But yeah. you couldn't know any, the less you knew about that, the better. Right. But one interesting, and up until uh, just a few years ago, I was wondering, is this all true, what, what I'm thinking? Yeah. However, uh, I had uh, one farm there, which was about uh, 12, 13 kilometers from where we lived, where I delivered messages as well. And I came there one day and Oh, hello there. I met a fellow that I went to school with. I hadn't seen him for quite a while. And we never asked each other why he was there or anything at all. You just didn't do anything. However, at uh, that place, his parents were there as well. I didn't see them, but they had to go 
in hiding because their oldest son uh, had fought against the Germans. So he was in hiding from uh, 1940 on, so after the war. Uh, there were several young men there as well, but I di didn't see anybody except for uh, her and the farmer and the fellow I went to school with, and they had a girl my age as well. So we had just started to play uh, a few games, uh, card games, and the farmer comes up to me and says, look, go home right away, tell your father that the Germans are on the way. So on the bike I went and I raced home. I wasn't out of the lane yet, and there had this big German truck came in, and I said, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? Anyway, uh, on, it was an open truck on the back with two rows, uh, two seats, or two rows, and four soldiers on each row with their guns up, waiting for action. And uh, I just looked at them and they didn't even look at me, so I hopped back on the bike and home I went. Uh, when I came home, I said, where is mom? Where is dad, mom? And mom said, he's gone, so don't worry. That's all I ever knew. However, it was uh, on one of our trips to the Netherlands that I stopped, or uh, my wife and I stopped by a friend of mine that I had gone to school with and uh, in the Netherlands, and we started talking. Usually, quite often, the war comes up. And also, uh, the, the resistance came up, and I said, and uh, I said, yeah, I have several places that I sent messages to. And I said, there was also a farm. And she said, where was that farm? And I told her, and she said, you know the name? And I said, yeah. And she started to laugh. She said, yes. She said, I was that little girl there. You brought messages to mom and dad, and <laughs> you had your eye on me as young as you were. <laughs> He, she had married my friend, <laughs> but oh, I just. How, <laughs> how, this is well, this is wonderful, and George, I do want to come back to you, but I want to bring Gunther into the conversation. Uh, Gunther, what's your earliest memory of the war? You were born in 1937. We can't hear you, Gunther. Could you unmute? Got it. Okay. Okay. My father was drafted into the German army in October. So we gave up our pastry shop in Königsberg and moved to the countryside about 50 kilometers away from Königsberg. And there lived on the farm the parents of my mother. <clears throat> in 1941, two German soldiers knocked on the door. And my grandmother and my mother started to cry and it turned out that one of the brothers of my mother had been shot down he was a pilot so they darkened the house for five days i was four years old i didn't get any food so i spent all the five five days with my grandfather in, in the sable opa and he gave me food and after five days they opened the curtains and then they talked to me again. That was my first memory of my childhood. Oh man, um, that's your first memory of your childhood. So you grew up in in Prussia, East, in Prussia. East Prussia, East Germany, under Russian uh, Germany. occupation. No, no, no. East Prussia was the province that was lost after World War II. The uh, Poles and the Russians got East Prussia, Silesia, and Pomerania. Right. That's and now I, Poland, Russia. I want to share this book. Uh, I found it here on Amazon. I would want to share the link with people and the book cover because it's a great, it's a great cover of you. Is that you? That's me when I was three years old in the boots of my father and his uh, military hat. I had a big head that fit. When I was <laughs> a teenager, people always called me fat head. <laughs> I'm sure they said it as a compliment. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> so, 
So what did your father, I'm sorry, go ahead. During the war, uh, I lived on, on grandpa's farm. We had all the food we wanted. The only thing we didn't have chocolate and oranges, but the people in the cities were starving, but we were not. My problem started in, on April the 15th when the Russians came in 1945, because uh, they chased us out. We had been trying to flee, they caught us. And during that night, I mean, I grew up in the country. I knew what sex was. During, the, uh, during that night, my mother was raped. And then we stayed for one year in Palmikin. That's a little town near the Baltic Sea, or on the Baltic Sea. And we were starving, wasn't good. And then after one year, the Russian com commandant of a town called Goldbach needed vodka. And the commandant of Palmikin needed workers, so the other way around. So we were loaded into trucks and brought from Palmikin to Goldbach. And there, my mother and my cousin and my aunts, they had to work on the cold coals 12 hours a day. Uh, this went on until 1948 to September. Then we were put in a cattle train. It took us two weeks to get to East Berlin. So you were transported to East Berlin in 1948. Yes. And you uh, were 11 years old. Yes. Uh, then we were put into some uh, uh, little village. We fled illegally to West Germany. We got to West Germany, to Ulsen. And my father, <laughs> during all this time, he was caught by the British in 1945, since he was a cook and a pastry chef. They gave him a job in the British military canteen. Meaning he had access to food and booze and chocolate and women. And, and, women. <laughs> and when we came, he lived with a woman. He didn't want to see us. And then he put us in the refugee camp for two years. And he went to Cologne to live with another woman. Oh my, what a story. How did you get to the United States? Uh, that's kind of embarrassing. I did not come for economic reasons. The marriage of my parents was very bad. And so the marriages of the parents of our friends of mine, and they never wanted to get married. In 1962, I fell in love with a girl and there was pressure, get married, get married. My, my parents, her mother, and I just want to escape. So I, if I had gone to London or Paris, she would have followed me. So I went to New York. <laughs> For the first two years, I made less money than I made in Germany. <laughs> then I had a lot of girlfriends. And in 1974, a young woman asked me for a game of tennis. That's the one I married. That's married. <laughs> 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 Talk about school or the Russian time. Yeah, the, the, the Russian time, uh, first of all, my, my worst was there was no school for the German children. So I spent my time uh, with my cousin, a girl, uh, finding wood, <laughs> growing wood, and chopping wood, and collecting acorns, stealing potatoes, uh, begging, uh, and, and so on. This went on for two and a half years because uh, they were, it was my mother and her sister, and they had five kids. So my grandmother had to take care of five kids. And according to them, I was the worst. So my, my grandma called me my first name. She almost called me lazy guy or bum or what? Well. Oh, Gunter, you're breaking up and you're, you're we can't. I think you've come back. Okay. So you were called a lazy bum by your grandmother and your mother? My grandmother, yeah. Because she could hear where we saw wood, chopping wood. And if it, she didn't hear noise, she said, get to work, get to work. And uh, that sounds and very I, Prussian. Jim, she was a very nice lady, but I was difficult. I, I, I did not behave well. And uh, when I came home, she stood over me, towered over me with the wash rack to hit me on the face. 
Mary, how, I don't know you, but how much of this story did you know when you met Gunter and when you got married? Really, practically none of it. Uh, he started When he started to write his book, it was years later, years into our, our marriage, and I, I was just amazed. Not only what Gunter had been through, but I had the most wonderful mother-in-law. His, his mother was an amazing woman. And the thought that she had experienced everything that she had, that I hadn't known anything about that was just, just uh, shocking to me. Oh, to to, to uh, make the story uh, a little bit more complete, when we had, we had been married for two years and we went to Cologne to see my mother and my mother looked at Mary and she said, why did you marry him? You could have done better. <laughs> You can't have a better mother-in-law than that. You know, oh my gosh. Maybe not yeah. a great mother, but a great mother-in-law, yeah. <laughs> she was a wonderful, wonderful person. And and Gunter's book is, yes, it's about his childhood and everything he experienced, but it's also a tremendous tribute to her and what she she experienced during that time. Well, and the, last time we, the last time we saw her, she said to Mary, I hope to succeed in turning him into a civilized person. <laughs> Did you succeed, Mary? I call it a work in progress. <laughs> still, still working on it, huh? Okay, let me ask you this, Gunter. If you were that cantankerous, if you were that difficult a uh, child and young person, and I don't know if you were, did that maybe help you survive the ordeal that was your early life? I would say so, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And... Um... After I was in Germany, when I was 17, 18, I wanted to travel. So I hitchhiked all over. I went all over Germany. I went to Denmark, to Sweden, to England, to Scotland, to Austria, to Paris, all hitchhiking. And uh, that opened my eyes, and I want to come to America, and that, that also helped me. So you sound to me brave, uh, um, tough, Probably brave, adventurous. Uh, I like to marry. Just remind me, the best meal I ever had in East Prussia. Uh, the Russians in 1947. Cold winter was like in Chicago. I went begging, and I had a little amber. I hope I don't cry now. And I knocked on the door, and a Russian officer opened the door. It's, he smelled of vodka, and it smelled of uh, fried onions and fried bacon and fried pota potatoes. And he asked me to sit down. I sat down, and it disappeared. Then he came back with a, with a chamber pot. It was filled with goulash and kashka, uh, kasha, uh, egg, sausage, and I ate. Was when was half through. I saw a yellow ring in the middle. I said, "No, no, don't worry, eat." So I kept eating, and then he filled it again. He gave me a loaf of bread and sent me home. That was the best meal I had in, in three and a half years. When I came home, Oma cooked cooked soup of the of the. I'm going to ask you to repeat that, Gunter. You broke up on us. You've frozen here. Can you repeat that, the end of the story? How far did they get? The Russian officer gave me a lot of food, served yes. in a chamber pot. Right. And I finished half, and I saw a yellow ring inside. I said, oh, don't worry. Eat the rest. Grandmother and she cooked three for for the nine of us. Um, you know, I did. One of my cousins uh, starved to death. She had tuberculosis, and my grandfather also died very early after half a year. Oh my! Uh, there's another terrible. May I continue? You know, yeah, let's have you continue a little bit. Then I want to go to Daggy again. Um, yeah, could you please continue? Uh, 
I hope you don't lose me now. In 1945, in May, all the German men, meaning men 65 and over, and some boys who were 13, 14, had to go to the beach. And they were asked to undig bodies of people who had been shot, 3,000 Jewish women. My grandfather came home, he cried, he read the Bible. Half a year later, he died. And when I wrote my book in 1998, I went back to Kaliningrad. And to my horror, I noticed that the archivists of the city of Kaliningrad had no idea what had happened. They said, are you sure you know? I said, yes, I know. How do you know? I said, I read a book and had information from Yad Vashem at Jerusalem and from Wiesenthal in Los Angeles. And in the so I went sent information and then there were articles in the Russian press and then I was interviewed by the New York Times a reporter from Moscow. I could send you the article and uh, then they woke up and uh, about four, three and a half years ago I got a email from Kaliningrad would I be willing to help make me documentary? So they paid for my ticket. I flew to Kaliningrad in 2019 in January. Great, great time to go to Russia. Yeah. yeah. And we worked for five days to, on this documentary. Unfortunately, it hasn't been finished yet. Yeah, and COVID, COVID interfered. Yes. So here is Kaliningrad, just for uh, you know our audience here, our members. Uh, Kaliningrad is this non-contiguous part of Russia, still is a part of Russia. It um, is traditionally or historically considered Prussian. This was Prussia, Königsberg, what Kaliningrad was called Königsberg. And Königsberg. there's a part, let's say two thirds more than this Russian part. That's today Poland. That was East Prussia. Right. And where did you grow up? Could you show us on the map where you grew up? Uh, it's too small. Uh, in, in a little village uh, east of uh, Kaliningrad. Oh, Kaliningrad. so you right about here in this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. That's where you grew up, and you grew up a German speaking. Yeah, uh, everybody spoke German. I mean, it was German for seven hundred years, and in nineteen forty-four on August. The sky got very red. I asked my grandfather, what's going on? He said, they're bombarding Königsberg. He said, don't worry, it's far away. But that was only uh, 40 miles away. Oh, my. Gunter, thank you. I'm eager to read your book and to get in touch with you and Mary again and have you on our program again, if you wouldn't mind. I'd like to know more of your uh, story. And I see Mr. Masters has joined us. Hey, Scott Masters, thank you for <laughs> thank you for putting uh, Gunter and Mary in, in touch and, and telling them to come on our our program this morning. Fascinating story, and I'm looking forward to reading his book. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. You're welcome. Daggy, you've been hearing these stories from George and Gunter. They're not like yours exactly, of course, but you know, it's the same trauma, it's the trauma of war. I've seen you nodding your head about the hunger and about um, having to keep quiet. I've been reading your memoir. My heart breaks for you and for what happened to your family. Um, your One of your earliest memories of war is having your, I guess, your older brothers go off to war in Finland. Yeah. Uh, your 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 father moves out, moves out of the house, and you and your mother are living alone in an apartment in Berlin. Yes. What was, the, what were the bombings like? Well, when the bombing first started, my mother decided not to go down into the air raid shelter. She kept us in our apartment and she would tell me to just lay in my bed and turn my face toward the wall 
and to believe it is thunder and lightning that was going on outside. And I was six years old and hated thunder and lightning. So to turn my face toward the wall and cover up with a pillow, I was still afraid. It, it, she, you know, I was a six year old girl and very much afraid. I kind of sat up every now and then and looked over to my mom that she was sleeping on a couch and saw all this lightning going on in front of our window. And it was, of course, the guns that were searching. The light, light came from the, the, the searchlights that were looking for the airplanes that were dropping the bombs. And for quite a while, my mom kept us in our apartment. And then one night, it got so hard. It got so hard that my mom jumped up and grabbed me out of the bed and down the stairs, we went toward the air raid shelter. And our neighbors that did the same thing as we did, they came out of the door and she was bleeding. The lady was pregnant and the windows had shattered and the glass apparently cut her. And I saw her just bleeding all over herself while mom was dragging me down the stairs to the air raid shelter. From then on, we sat in the air raid shelter every night. The bombing coming from, of course, it coming from England were day and night and they got harder and harder. And fear is all I knew. And up to this day today, I do not like thunder and lightning. I do not like any kind of loud noises going on. A truck going by me when we are on a highway driving scares me because all these noises bring me right back to where I used to be as a six year old child. Uh, day, day and night air raids, day and night hiding in the shelter, barely getting out of your clothes, uh, running for your life, making water brigades to help with the, get rid of the, the, the fire that was burning behind us in the house that went down behind us. Uh, this is all I knew. And when I came out of the air raid shelter, when I went in, it was dark. When I came out of the air raid shelter, it was red all around me. And when there is a big fire, the wind starts blowing and the flames and the, it looked like lightning bugs, bugs flying by me. And mom would kind of sh shake her hands so that they wouldn't catch me. It was unbelievable to explain the sirens going on, trying to get to the fire and, and, and get, you know, putting water onto it. The night was filled with noises after the, the clear sirens sounded. It was unbelievable to describe. And the smell in the air, the smell of war and the burning buildings and what was laying under it, it was all around us and this is what I knew and this is what I grew up in. I saw my friends die, I saw their bodies lying in front of me and we were just living day by day to live for the next day, never knowing if we would have a next day. But you see I had many of them because I'm 87 and I'm here to tell the story. But I want to tell the people that were speaking before me that my heart really goes out to you. You had a mark on your back, just like my father did. Adolf Hitler placed a mark on the back of people that were against him. And so was my father. And he was taken away from me, but he lived. He lived. He was put into Plötzensee, uh, the prison, the, the camp the concentration camp for German political prisoners. But he lived, he came home to us. Due to my brothers fighting in Finland and wearing that most dreaded uniform of all, the SS uniform. But it saved my father's life. You know, I wrote in my book all about it. So, but to, to answer you, Todd, to live through that, I would not wish that on anyone. 
I'm standing for freedom, I'm standing for remaining free and do all that we can to remain free from anything like it happened to me and so many others. Daggy's written four books. Two of them are memoirs of her time in Germany, Daggy Story Part One and Daggy Story Part Two. Uh, the first part, of course, is as a young girl in Ger growing up in Berlin. And the second part is meeting her husband, her GI husband, moving to the United wow. States. You also have a wonderful children's book um, yeah. with, your, uh, with your father story. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then your tribute to Gail Haverstam, the candy bomber. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The other, another very, it's it's hard to read your book, Daggy. It, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you, it, it's not, it's hard to read yeah. and putting your, if I put myself in your shoes, it's hard for me to understand how you can go through life and being ever able to smile again. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a very strong belief, Todd. You know, I'm going to have to say that. Yes. I started to believe as a small child, child when my mom said, Daggy, you pray, you pray. And I said my own prayers, mom didn't teach me, but I started to believe that there was someone that was watching over us. And there's no way of explaining why we came out alive when millions, millions didn't. Right. You know, the question to that will be answered one day, but not today. Right. But my strong belief in the good is what's helping me through everything. And I'm a very strong person in somebody had me by the shoulders and my family. And for whatever reason, I'm here to tell the story. We all had marks on our back. When Adolf Hitler had you in his eyesight, he didn't let go. And many, many lost their lives. And the underground in Berlin was also very active. As a matter of fact, there was a story in the newspaper about somebody being cut that was in the underground. And <clears throat> I want to kind of tell that right quick. On the railroad stations, there were patrol, patrols out. And every now and then they would stop you and ask you for your ID your passport or whatever, you know. And uh, a troop train was coming in. The soldiers were coming on furlough. And this story was written in the newspaper back home. And um, apparently one of the guards that was on duty at that railroad station <clears throat> stopped one of the soldiers that were coming on furlough and asked him for his ID, showing that he was on furlough. Well, he showed him the ID. And what this soldier saw was the name of a friend on that pass that was deceased. Boy. So he knew he had somebody in front of him that was uh, not, right. not like the name on a pass that he had. <clears throat> and they cut all of them. They cut the underground that was called the Red Circle. Mm. And that was published in a newspaper because they apparently were proud of it, that they cut all these people. But the underground was working in my hometown and all over Germany. And I know when I went into <clears throat> the area of Poland as a small child, I even think that my foster parent who wore the SR uniform I believe strongly that he was connected with the underground, you know, and I got to love this man. I hated the uniform he wore, the brown uniform. The only uniform I trusted was the one that everyone else hated, the SS uniform, but my brothers wore them. So I trusted that uniform, but the brown uniform, the brown shirts, I did not trust. And when I got to, to, to have a foster parent, that was wearing one of those brown shirts. I found out later on in what I believed in and what happened in that house, that this man was part of the underground wearing that brown shirt, but doing all he could to help the Polish people. That is my firm belief. I cannot prove it. 
But from what I knew about him and what when I lived with them and what we did while I was living with them, I truly believe that this man in that brown uniform, brown shirt, was part of the underground in Poland. You know, I have so many stories to tell. Oh, so you know, many. many. Yeah. It. It's, it's amazing how many stories you three have. And I do want to give an opportunity to people to ask questions. If they have a question of Daggy or George or Gunter, please do raise your hand, unmute yourself, ask it. Sean, Sean Hall. Uh, yeah, it's incredible stories uh, this morning. And, you know, I, I just sort of thinking of the, the children who have gone through the recent withdrawals from Afghanistan and a lot of the violence that was happening there. And I just sort of have a general question for you all is at what point in your life did you find safety or did you feel safe or have you ever felt safe? I certainly did. I felt safe when I came to America. I did not feel safe all that time, even, you know, through 48 and 49, when we had the candy drops and all that. They were still coming from the east part of Berlin and abducted people in the west. And my father had become a refugee and came to the West, from East Berlin to West Berlin. And he had that, that mark on his back. And he was always afraid that one of these days walking down the street, somebody would grab him, pull him into the car and take him back because the Russians wanted him to work for them. You know, he was very talented, very smart. They wanted him in Russia to work for another war, like my dad said. And that made him a refugee from East Berlin to West Berlin. But we never felt safe, never, never, ever. And I've had, felt the first safety when I got on that ship General Patch and came from Bremerhaven to America. When I stood on American soil on that ship, that's when I felt safe. And that's the way I've been feeling ever since. And I want to do everything I can to secure <clears throat> stay that way. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Wonderful answer to the question. George, yeah. how about you, George? Um, you immigrated not to the United States, but to Canada in 1950 or so? 51, yeah. 51? Why did you leave? Holland and, and come to Canada? Well, after, during the war, um, it's a, a lot of it is for personal reasons. However, uh, my father got to be known in the resistance as if Schwarzer can do it, nobody can. And that didn't sit well with some of the people in the resistance. Uh, two of them squealed on him. And to make a very long story short, uh, we ended up on the list to go to uh, Camp Westerbark concentration camp. So you were, so the Germans put you on the list to send you to a concentration camp? Two of his people that worked with him in the resistance squealed on him. Boy, oh boy. And because it was near the end of the war, and the Canadians were on the way. And uh, this actually saved us from going to the concentration camp. There's a lot more to this story. It's a very, very long story. However, I visited Camp Westerbark and I found something at Camp Westerbark. And it is a small little black it's black rock, and that rock has been with me whenever I talk about the war, some bad places. Uh, that little rock has been my help to find out a lot of what happened during the Second World War with us and our family. And also, uh, that uh, at one time I received a hundred handwritten pages that my father had written 
And I looked at the numbers on the pages and that didn't work out to me because it was page 200 to 300. And it took me four years to find uh, the rest uh, of his writing up to over a hundred handwritten pages. And that rock has been a big help to me. However, uh, this is a long story, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it's amazing how this all happened. And uh, there were many times during the war, mm. the Germans were after him. And one morning, my brother and I, we were just home and dad had gone to the market, uh, mm. to the city um, in uh, Balzwart, three kilometers away. And the message came, the Germans are after him. So my brother and I took off. My brother told me, you take the highway, I take the shortcut because he could run faster than I could. And uh, just in case that comes back home to the highway. So anyway, he got there in time to save him that time. Uh, so there were many, many times that, you know, yeah. scary. Where if he feels safe, yeah, we felt safe after we were liberated. Uh, but were you ever safe, real safe? I don't know. I really don't know. Because the, the stories are coming and coming and coming, and there doesn't seem to be an end to the war stories if you keep on digging. Yes, and here's a picture of you on the boat, I think, on your way to Canada. Yeah, here's a, left. Yeah. a portrait okay. of you and your family. This was just taken before. My, my older brother came here a year before. He came in 1950, and we came in 1951. Okay. And then you ended up joining the Canadian Air Force, the Royal yes. Air Force. Yes, and I had three crashes under my belt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because I got out of the Air Force, that saved me from dying in the next crash. However, that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> Boy, the, the wonderful stories here. Uh, any other questions that we have from... Uh, yes, Paul. Gunter. Uh, well, frankly, from 1949 to 1961, I always felt uneasy in West Germany. I thought the Russians would come. And in August of 1961, I went to a party. Well, we celebrated till five in the morning. Someone made breakfast. There were 20 people who turned on the news. And on the news was a terrible... Uh, story that the Russians were building, no, the East Germans were building a wall around Berlin. Yep. So I thought World War III would start. I went home and my relationship with my father was not very good. But on that day, he called me into his uh, bakery, closed the door, and he said, I don't want you want you ever to be cannon fodder for the war. I said, I'll give you a thousand marks. Leave and go to Spain or maybe Morocco or Algeria. But don't, and, and send us postcards. Don't leave now. I don't want you to, to go into an army. If World War Three starts, don't ever ride home. And that was one of the greatest movement, uh, moments I had with my father. Yeah. And then where did you where did you go from there in 1961? Oh, I, I stayed. I mean, I didn't. I did not go to Spain. I stayed another three years, and then uh, I told you the rest of the story. Okay. Yes. And then you came to the U.S. So then in 1964. 64. Yes. 64 to escape a girl. Two and four hundred dollars in an address in California. That was it. Oh my gosh! How fantastic! Other questions out there. I want to go to uh, Ron Gianta before uh, we end the program. Ron, how are you? Thank you for hopping on this morning with us. Uh, Ron's always a great representative from the VA. Do you have an update maybe you want to give us? Well, Todd, not really. Outside of the fact, just to remind our veterans about, uh, don't forget to, you know, if you haven't gotten your third shot yet for the COVID virus, I strongly encourage everybody to get that third shot. I've gotten the third shot myself back in September. 
you know, this this COVID nineteen with this Omicron variant is it does it, it it's hitting everywhere, and we need to take care of each other. But there is one thing I would like to talk about very quickly, and. In the year 2022, the VA is putting a very strong emphasis on homeless veterans. And I got a press release today out of uh, VA Central in Washington that the VA has designated $20 million from the American Rescue Plan funds for flexible, fen f flexible funding for homeless veterans. And it's going to the VA, med the VA hospitals. Now, there's 171 VA hospitals in the system in the United States. And if you break that $20 million down, it doesn't, it only goes to like a hundred or so thousand dollars, but there's help out there for homeless veterans. There's a very, very strong um, push to help hopeless veterans get them off the streets. Or if a veteran is in danger of becoming homeless because of funds and whatever, that the VA is there to help these veterans. And I have a toll-free phone number of 1-877-424-3838. That is our main homeless toll-free phone number for veterans who need assistance. And I've actually used that phone number myself to help veterans. And then when they make the phone call, they within 24 hours, they're contacted by their local uh, VA hospital department to help them with their needs. And uh, also for Pittsburgh, I'm one of the homeless coordinators for the VBA in Pittsburgh. I just helped another veteran yesterday. I get emails all the time. So this is a huge issue for our veterans. And we all have to, as veterans, all of us have to work together to take care of each other. Right. And, and Ron, you are one of those people who, who really takes care of veterans. And I want anybody out there who has a question about benefits that they might be entitled to, you know, benefits they have a question about, uh, or if they know of a veteran who needs help, please do not hesitate to contact me. I'll put you in contact with Ron. Ron is by far the most responsive veterans advocate that I've ever worked with. Um, do you seem to just plow through any obstacles that get in the way of finding the information you need. Thank you, Ron, very much. Thank you so much, Todd. I just want to say thank you to your guests. I am like in awe of their stories from World War II. You're a historian, and I enjoy reading books about World War II because our young, we cannot let our younger generations forget yeah. what the world has experienced. And we exactly. can and we have to remember. And, you know, you think about, and I know, uh, Michael, you have your, I think you have your hand up, Michael. I want you to go next. And then Scott Masters, I, if I ran into George or Daggy or Gunter, I wouldn't, there's nothing, there's no sign on them that says what they've experienced. You, you have to sit down, take the time and ask. And I'm so glad that we've done that here. Michael, why don't you unmute? Yes. Uh, you hear me? Yes. How are you, Michael? Uh, about the, being a homeless veteran, uh, I was helped by two programs that were not part of, they're not, that were subservient to the, the, uh, the VA. Uh, one is called Soldier On. They put me in contact with another group uh, called uh, the Veterans Place, which is on Washington Boulevard in, in Pittsburgh. Right. They helped me. Uh, they have two programs, a relocation program and a reentry program. And uh, they, do, they both all do marvelous work in, alongside the VA. They actually are, uh, I, guess, I guess you'd call them subcontractors to the VA. Right. These yes. are all nonprofit organizations that help homeless veterans. And when we have veterans to contact us, they're looking for assistance. We refer them to Soldier On or to the Veteran Leadership Program because they have their own program going on. There's a lot of help out there for veterans, and we need to get the word out to those veterans who do need help. Soldier On, Veterans Place, Veterans Leadership Program here in the Pittsburgh area. Wonderful work. George. Yeah, it's the same thing here, uh, Ron, uh, with the veterans. Um, uh, also, please get your shot because I got that mine yesterday, the third one. So thank you. Good. George in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Mr. Masters, how are you? Thank you for directing these wonderful people to our program here. 
<laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very, very glad that I was able to do that. George, it's nice to see you again. And Gunter, it's nice, here, to meet, nice, nice to meet you as well, Gunter. I'll look, look forward to talking to you more. I'm, I'm reading your book right now and enjoying it tremendously. It might be a little, there we are. Um, really, really great read. And I, I look forward to getting into it this afternoon. I would have loved to have been here for the whole show today, Todd, but I'm in Zoom class with my students. And I've got to go back to them in just a couple of just a couple of moments. But I, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed being able to, to sit in for a bit. And I look forward to, to connecting with all of you guys again. Yes, Mr. Masters is one of those poor unfortunates with a job. Um, so he has to he can't he can't be on every time. But if you can't get enough of, of Scott. You can come on Monday morning, Monday at 9 a.m. We've never done a 9 a.m. Monday morning program, but we are doing one on Monday, January 10th with Scott Masters and Glenn Flickinger. The guest is going to be Sir Max Hastings, who's the premier or certainly one of the premier historians of the Second World War. And the program is going to focus on the role of the merchant marine in World War II, uh, the Canadian and the U.S. merchant marine. And we have three Merchant Marine veterans Scott has contacted, uh, Ray Cameron, Percy Smith, Hugh Brody will all be on and they'll be sharing their stories. And Max Hastings will be talking also about the Merchant Marine and especially Operation Pedestal, which is a, an operation that's not as well known in the U.S. as it is in Canada. It involved uh, supplying the island of Malta, a critical British base in Malta in 1942, and the hundreds and hundreds of merchant mariners who went down uh, in that convoy uh, that did succeed in the end. Got to go to class, Mr. Masters. Thank you for joining us. Daggy, thank you. George, Gunter, thank you all for sharing just a little bit of your story. Can we, I'd love to have you all back sometime and I want to be in, in touch with you about that because I know we just scratched the surface of your stories this morning. Thank you for joining us and uh, have a good day, everybody. Have a good rest of the week, and we'll see you on Monday morning and Monday night. All right? Take care.